Good evening. I'm Nicole DePasquale with the American Association of Chemistry Te Teachers. Thanks for joining us and welcome to tonight's chat with Kat Kathy Kitzman, recipient of the James Bryant Conant Award presented by the American Chemical Society, which is our parent organization. For those of you who don't know, the Conant Award recognizes and encourages outstanding teachers of high school chemistry, like Kathy, who joins us from Farmington Hills, Michigan this evening, where she teaches AP Chemistry and high school chemistry level courses. Hi, Kathy. How are you? I'm great. Nicole, how are you? Good. Well, the purpose of tonight's chat is for Kathy to share some insights and ideas um, about her experience as a teacher of chemistry and hopefully inspire ideas, ideas and teachers that are watching. Um, just as a reminder, this is a live broadcast. So if you're watching us on Google+, you can interact and ask questions using the Q&A tool. Um, and we will moderate questions. Um, myself and another ACT staff member will moderate questions throughout the broadcast. So if you don't see your question come up immediately, um, it will come up at some point. So I just wanted to let you know that. So uh, Kathy, let's just get started. I want to ask if you would talk a little bit about your, um, you know, your early career as a teacher and your background and how you got started in your education and, and things like that. Okay. Well, I attended uh, Taylor University in, in Indiana and I got a bachelor's degree in chemistry and in teaching. Um, student taught my senior year of college. And then I wasn't really sure if I wanted to teach. So I actually went to graduate school at the University of I got in medicinal chemistry. And then I decided I really didn't like being in a lab all day with like the same five people day after day after day. And I wanted to be with more people. So I started applying for some teaching jobs. And that was in 1974. Uh, and I got my first job at a place called uh, Our Lady of Mercy High School in Farmington Hills, Michigan, which is actually where I am teaching now. I didn't teach there the whole time, but uh, I came to nine for all that time. So, yes, yeah, job, and I started out with it's an all girls Catholic school, Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, the earliest early years were not easy. <laughs> um, I I occasionally run into someone that I taught that year. <laughs> I always apologize. I'm sorry. I think I've gotten a little better since then, but it was very tough. It was very tough teaching, and I don't think if, I think if I had been anywhere other than a particular school, I might not have stayed in teaching. Wow. So, so what, yeah. kept you, what kept you there, despite how difficult it was for you? I'm sorry? What kept you there, despite how difficult you said it was in the early years? Yeah. Um, I think it was just, I think the people that were around me there were very supportive. And I think maybe they saw something, you know, they figured give me it's just that new teachers have to do and have to learn. And I had good people around me guiding me. Um, back the second year, the first day of that second year was a thousand percent. It, and I think it was just knowing I could get through a year. I, I, I've been through it once. I can do this. <laughs> so it really... You know, it, it did get a lot better. So, you know, yeah. good people around me, that was important. Did you have anyone in particular, like a mentor um, or fellow teacher who really who really stuck with you, that stuck with you and, um, you know, made, made a really big impression and helped you in your early career? Well, the, my, I think the whole department I worked with, but the other chemistry teacher was... I sort of tried to model myself after her. She hadn't been teaching that much long, but um, we, I just really learned a lot from her that first year. So it wasn't an official mentoring kind of situation. 
like these days there's more you know more in place now for mentors but sure. more of an informal mentoring yeah sure so um, you know you mentioned mm -hmm. that you you were in the lab and you wanted to be around more people and that's kind of one of the things that appealed to you about teaching what else appealed right. to you about teaching and and what what else made you go in that direction um I think, you know, as, as teachers, and especially teachers, in my case, in a private school, we're sort of the masters of our own destiny. You know, we can pretty much design our program. I know a lot of teachers can't. You know, we can pick our books, and I know a lot can't, but all of those things, there's just the freedom to uh, develop the program, to develop what you want to do. and. Um, I have felt that I've had opportunities to be very creative in the classroom that I might not have. I didn't feel I had that. I could have done that in the lab. I just didn't feel that was my direction, you know. And I've enjoyed just kind of brainstorming ideas with other teachers, coming up with ideas to try, learning from others. That was just it's something almost something new every day, really. Is that is that what you say keeps you coming back every day and keeps you coming back into the classroom and excited about what you're doing? Yep, I think so, definitely. Um, you know, as I get older, it does get harder to go you know, to to uh, go day after day and keep the energy level up. So I come home a little more tired than I maybe did 20 years ago, but. Yeah, the kids are what keep me going back. The kids in the classroom. Yeah. Great. And what I love teaching think? chemistry. <laughs> Great. So what would you say is the coolest part of your job? That you, you think, wow, this is awesome, I get to do this. <laughs> well, uh, I have a one of my t-shirts that I have says, uh, they let me play with chemicals. <laughs> so there you go. I like to play <laughs> But I want well, you know, I mean, within reason. Yeah. But um, no, it, yeah. yeah, it's that's cool. That's cool. I get to uh, uh, well, I should could say I get to do explosions, but I'm not much of an explosions person. Okay. I like colorful chemistry. Okay. <laughs> I like to do things that change colors and teaching girls. That's always fun. They like the colors too. And, Lots of cool things. So I want to talk, I mentioned at the beginning that you are the recipient of the 2014 Conan Award, um, which is a prestigious award that is presented to only one teacher of chemistry each year. Um, what did winning this award mean to you? Well, it, it's very, very humbling and it's quite an honor, quite it just stuns you when you hear that you've won this. Um, to be recognized in that regard is the pinnacle. You know, it's really the pinnacle of my teaching career. Um, and I have many friends who have won it before me, and I've always admired them greatly. Um, I. And I have friends who I'm sure in the future will be winners. Uh, I can see how they're going to develop. You know, not just at my school or in my area here in Michigan, but all across the country and the world, they're the best people. And Okay, you make me cry now. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting teary-eyed. I'm getting teary-eyed. No, um, <laughs> to be, I just feel that I represent all of these wonderful people. So, break time. No. <laughs> no, that's. I love that's, them all. And great. It was just an honor. The, the worst part was they called me in June. Uh, the president of ACS called the end of June. She said, I could not tell anybody till September 8th. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> That's a long time. I couldn't. No, I will. I will admit I told a couple people. <laughs> yes, yeah, that was hard. I yeah. was excited. Yeah. That's great. So, um, so <laughs> tell, a, tell us a little bit about, yeah. about the, um, the person who nominated you and uh, the process that you go through to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, I was nominated a while back for the regional award for the central region, and I won that in 19, I think it was 96. And that was uh, done by the local ACS Education Committee. They put that nomination packet together. And it used to be that to become the CONA, you had to be a regional winner first. But they've changed those, that procedure. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be nominated have to have been a regional winner. So a while back, um, one of my colleagues from my school, Lisa Scrimshire, and she, she became the primary nominator for me. And she put the nomination package together. And then a couple other people, uh, assistant principal, Colleen Rosman, and a friend from Science Fair, Tim Fino, they wrote the supporting nomination letters. And, and you just send it off and wait. <laughs> wait and see what happens. So, I'd like to congratulate the 2015 winner, Janelle Bell from Chico High School in California. That's her. I don't know her, but I hope. <laughs> well, you share something in common, obviously. So, yep. That's very nice of you. Um, so, one of the attributes that nominators are asked to demonstrate um, about their nominees is that they have the ability to challenge and inspire students. How do you do this? How do you challenge and inspire your students? I think, um, I think in the class, I, the number one thing probably is that I try to show my love of and I tell them right up front, I'm a chemistry geek. I'm a chemistry nerd. I don't expect them to pay, but I hope that they can see how much it means to me. And then uh, a lot of this different activity. Um, and I use music in my classes, uh, a lot of songs. Things related to me, throw in there every once in a while, make them sing along, um, do silly things like uh, talk about water and wear Mickey Mouse ears so that you, they realize the water molecule looks like a Mickey, Mickey Mouse. But you can't have a lot of, you can't take yourself too seriously if you're a high school teacher. Now I'm very serious about what I teach and I want them to learn it, but I want them they come into chemistry pretty nervous mm -hmm. most of them and pretty afraid. So I try to make sure they have a little fun, you know, while we're being serious too. Um uh yeah. And with my, I have AP chemistry classes. I actually two classes of those. Sorry, two classes this year of AP chem, and that's a lot more challenging, a lot more serious. But we still try to lighten up in there once in a while too. Try to challenge them. Oh, and then, you know, I have like eight thousand pairs of earrings and <laughs> twenty thousand T-shirts, and no, not really, and. Uh, you know, chemistry jokes and just you know, just wearing a pair of earrings catches their eyes. Mm -hmm. We have my colleague and I have the Tom's periodic table shoes. The kids know notice. They notice and they're just like oh. you know, mm -hmm. they it just catches their interest. Yeah. So we actually have a question from the audience. Um, and it's 
Why do you think chemistry is important in a high school education, and how does it translate into everyday life? Okay. That one didn't come through at all. Oh, it didn't come? I'm sorry. Let me repeat myself. We have a question from okay. the audience, and it's, why do you think chemistry is important in a high school education, and how does it translate into everyday life? Well, I have signs up in my room that say, what in the world isn't chemistry, mm -hmm. for starters, mm -hmm. and right from day one of the class, when I talk to my first year chemistry students, try to get their chemistry. Um, I ask them right off the bat, what did you what did you do today that used chemistry? And then they start to think about, you know, well, I took a shower and I washed my hair, or I brushed my teeth, or I ate breakfast or you know put on clothes I said did you put on clothes today and they laugh you know, I said, it's all chemistry everything around you and you know yes along the way you're talking about atoms and electrons and balancing and what's the day-to-day -day, you know use of that but I you know there's just so many ways you can incorporate everyday things into chemistry so that's what you try to do Mm -hmm. Not that I think you have to make every single little thing relevant for education. There's there's things you should should learn to learn them. Mm. And you know we have, I run into people adults all the time that you just you, what do you do? Three oh I hated chemistry. <laughs> chemistry was my worst subject. I failed chemistry. Oh, that's so typical, and it's, I hate to hear that because mm -hmm. I would hope that more people would say, "Oh, I loved chemistry. It was my favorite subject." Those are few and far between. So, let, I want to um, I want to give folks an idea of what Kathy's classroom is like. So let's. Um, I just want to ask you some questions related to kind of what it's like in your classroom. It sounds really fun. Uh, what's a typical day like for your students and for you, if there is such thing as a as a typical day? Wow, well, I don't really have a tip because um, because it just you know it varies from day to day. Um, I still have some days that are more, you know, traditional kind of little lecturing going on, but um, more and more over the years, we've incorporated these uh, these chem quests, edited inquiries, um, where the students are going through questions on their own. Ending of sample, we just did one on significant figures, which is such a hard concept for them to retain or even understand. But uh, um, things on their own, and then they, you know, come up to me to get help or to get checked checked off on certain things. And ah, boy, and then I have a song on significant figures, and then we have a lab activity on significant figures, and what else? Um, so, you know, just trying to use, do different things to help them understand a difficult concept. Um, so I don't know, a typical day, a typical day, yeah, yeah. Today in the AP Chem class we did a, on a lab station which I used to have them all do individually, but we had to kind of do it as a group today because, anyway, it's a long story. So it all has to do with technology, and we don't want to go there right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. What would you, what would you say is, um, you've listed, that you, you know, there's no typical day, it sounds like, but 
What would you say is your yeah. favorite activity to do with your students and to do in your classroom, if you had to choose one? <laughs> I like to. I like to use that phrase a lot, you know, today you're going to be doing my favorite lab. And of course, I say that every time we do a lab, but you know. Um, or today you're going to, I'm going to show you my favorite activity. But I think one of my favorites is actually one that I submitted to the AACT mm -hmm. for your for your resources. Oh, perfect. And it's at I actually love to beg, not beg, but we borrow from each other a lot and we adapt and we modify and share and that's wonderful. I, but I actually think this one's original and it's called Ionic Compounds Identification. Mm -hmm. I'll try to explain it quickly. <laughs> when they're in the midst of naming and writing formulas of compounds, it's a lot of desk work and in our case computer tutoring and tutor quiz, quizzes and just a lot of sitting at your desk. Not real exciting. So I thought we got to get them up, get them up out of their seats. So and anybody can come up with this with whatever compounds you have in your stock room, just go in there, make little vials. We have 21. We have seven of three because we have seven labels. So it, each set of three has either the name of the compound on the vial or the formula. So they go to a table, they lift up the vial, and they have to, first of all, write down what it looks like. So they describe it. They put the color. They, so again, I let them get all descriptive with their girls love to describe colors in wonderful ways. So they write down the color, and then they describe, is it crystals? Is it a powder? Is it? chunks, pellets, you know, just to get a feel. What does it look like? If the name is given, they write the formula. If the formula is given, the name. So just like out of your seat, going around, and I tell them, you're looking at real live chemicals now, <laughs> which of course they're not live. But instead of just on the bird, where you think I just made up all these names and formulas, these are real compounds. You can find, I hope, the ones that are more colorful around and schools necessarily, I think, because you're just putting them in a little vial and whatever. That's that one. Okay. So you mentioned this um, a little while ago, uh, just briefly, something about mini labs or labs. You've presented at conferences before about the lab stations and Flynn Scientific, who I'm sure people are very familiar with. Um, you know, based a kit. There's actually a kit you can buy based on your idea for these mini labs. Um, can you tell us about those and, and how you came up with the idea for them and what what they what constitutes them? Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure how or why we started doing them. I think many, many years ago, um, I, I bought another teacher who did some to these mini labs. We call them mini labs or lab stations. Um, and basically, you just take a topic. I think the first one we ever did was on gas laws. And you can do design map these to any lab, whatever your lab facilities look like. So our labs have seven lab tables. So typically, we'll have seven stations. Or one of the tricky bits is trying to figure out how long a station or, might take. And once once the students do them the first time, you kind of find out what, what they, you know, where they're at things down and so sometimes you might have doubles of a station um, but but they're meant to be short so that they go to a station and maybe in three four, four they're doing one little topic about and uh, and it, but it's all tied then to a bigger 
topic. So like, and then in the gas laws, for example, one of the stations is the can crusher, where they heat a can, a soda can, pop can, wherever you're from in the state, mm -hmm. pop can, a little bit of water, get the steam coming out, take a uh, beer tongs, flip the can over into a pan of ice water, and it, it implodes from the pressure of the air. And it noise. And they don't expect that, you know. But that's just one station. So that, and then over on the other side of the room, there's a group with the with a syringe and a and a miniature marshmallow in it, and they're testing pressure and volume relationships. And then in another part of the room, on another table, they're doing what we call pop pop the top on a actual old film tester with the cell water and they stand back and they time how long the cap takes for the cap to go off and that goes off with a loud pop and they all scream. <laughs> and tell them there's no screaming in the camera. But so they're moving around. They're not stationary. Mm -hmm. They're moving they're moving around from station to station. They're writing down observations and eventually um, with the gases we kind of introduce the whole chapter with these Many stations. Through the chapter, what did you find out about pressure and volume at that station? What, what did you find out about temperature and pressure with the can crusher? Um, so we we have been doing these now for many years, and we have um, I have them set up for a number of topics. And, Happy to share with people anybody that wants to know about them. You can just contact me. But um, we have this coming week. We're going to be doing a density mini stations lab. Um, and I'll just, if I have time, let me just tell you one other thing about the, kind of the evolution of all this too. Sure. Uh, reaction reaction types. This is my this is my forty first year of teaching right now. So when I started, when we would do some types, I did them the way I had always been in college. So every lab, you went to a lab table, you had an assigned lab drawer, you worked at your lab table, and all the chemicals were provided. You might. Eight or nines and four or five solids at every table, not to mention all the test tubes and stuff. So over the years, I thought, well, there's got to be a better way to do this. Then we moved it so out in the center of the lab, we had every all the chemicals set up, and we assigned kids to go in a different order. You start with reaction, start with five, you start with seven. And finally, it hit occurred to me, why don't we just put them at the tables? <laughs> and you, react one will be at table one, and react two, you know. And so much easier. <laughs> and you don't use as much equipment, and you don't use as many chemicals. You still might use the same amount of chemicals, but it's just set up differently. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot, lot better. Some of the they got but you keep a list from year to year of what you're using, and you go and you put it out the next year fairly easily. If you can store the stuff together, that helps. Like our, um, we do have a whole stations lab on atomic theory, and we keep it all in a big box because that's a lot more um, like analogies, not as much chemicals. So we keep all that together. And it can be a little harder to grade because you're not just grading mm -hmm. one little quick thing. You're grading seven or eight activities. Anyway, so that's, that's how that works. It's a lot of fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. Like being, I said, it's like being at a science museum. Yeah. 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 Fun. And I use them with the AP kids, not, not as much, but we have several... Uh, stations lab and with Shotley as principal stations lab, which I think is the one that um, when does a similar um, equilibrium 
So cool. I know in the in the Flynn kit they don't have as many stations in theirs. They have like four or five. Theirs are a little longer, a little more extensive. Right. Mine are a little shorter. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, those sound those sound excellent. They sound great. Um, I wanted to to go back on something you had said earlier. Um, you had talked about you know that you really enjoyed collaborating with your your coworkers and you enjoyed that process. And you had shared with me a little earlier that um, you worked on a collaborative process or a collaborative project, excuse me, involving the the textbook ACS textbook chemistry in the community and um, those students, and you worked also with um, your AP chemistry students and, and kind of bridged them together. Could you kind of talk about that collaborative project and um, you know what was that what was that about and the outcomes of it? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, we only did that only one year. We haven't gone back to it again. Not because we didn't like it. It's just. Uh, kind of the number of students varies from year to year, but sure. this particular time we tried it, my my colleague who taught was teaching is still teaching the ChemCom students. I don't know. I think she had maybe around 16 to 18 girls, and I had about that same number in AP Chem that year. And you know, we were realizing that that her her line of chemistry in ChemCom and AP Chem, it's not a big topic, but they need to know something about basic hydrogens and alkenes and alkenes and alkynes. So we got the idea of having her ChemCom kids teach AP Chem kids organic chemistry. So we paired them up, um, and the ChemCom girls had to make a poster that showed. Uh, the different organic compounds and the functional groups and had to quote teach them to one of the AP students. Uh, and then we had an assignment that the AP student had to um, and see to see if she understood what she had been taught. And uh, I don't know if we actually get this, maybe we did, I forget. But we I know they had to do an assignment and then they both got a grade sort of based on well the one learned it and how well the one taught it. And I think what was interesting is because the, the ChemCom students have a lot of times have the feeling that they, you know, in the lower level chemistry they're not as smart as the regular chem or the AP chem, but here they were able to actually teach someone that they had probably always maybe really always thought was smarter you could teach them. They knew something they didn't know. Mm -hmm. So that has been interesting to observe. Um, and I, you know, it would, be, it would be great to go back to it and see, you know, we didn't collect any research data or anything about this, mm -hmm. but it, it was more anecdotal. And some groups, of course, were, were better at it than others, but that's just normal mm -hmm. kid stuff. I'm sorry, Kathy. You broke up for a second there. Did you say something? Yeah, it was an interesting. Oh, okay. That we liked it. Yeah, we liked it. Great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, You're welcome. So I want to switch gears a little bit, or a lot of bit, um, and talk about the AP Chemistry curriculum. So you mentioned you you teach AP Chemistry. Um, and as most people are probably aware, last mm -hmm. fall the College Board um, unveiled a revised version of the curriculum, and it moves moving towards um, inquiry-based labs and focusing on developing uh, scientific reasoning skills. So, for May of this year, it was the first time the test was administered. Um, and so, what are your thoughts on the uh, curriculum revision, and how has that affected? How has the redesign affected your classroom and your students specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, I was um, quite leery about the changes, and actually, about a year or two ago, thinking, well, 
I'm not sure I really want to go through with this. Maybe it would be a good time to retire. <laughs> wow. But, yeah, really, that's what I, I kind of, but then I, as I looked into it more, and I had a workshop a year ago, and then I attended a week-long workshop last summer, and I felt that I liked I liked the changes. I liked the direction. I was I was up for the challenge of of trying some new things, trying to do some more um, inquiry type labs, and I like the whole idea of getting uh, the particulate level of matter better and having students draw pictures what's going on and then do it well. Um, so I know that I have mass nuances of the new curriculum, but I I've liked trying to work with it and mm -hmm. do what I can with it. That about last May was a really good test. I know it was a little long from what we all have said. Um, students just didn't get finished. They didn't get it finished. Mm -hmm. But the, the approach, the style of the questions was good. And um, and I think on the whole, that took the test, I was pleased with how they did. Okay. So we continue. We continue to tweak it and do mm -hmm. a little more this year. So, what kind of changes are you making? What tweaks are you making based on um, you know la having last year's experience and having the test, having experienced a new test? Mm -hmm. Um, I have just more lines of the whole drawing things. I've come up with some guidelines for them on how mm -hmm. to draw these particulate, particulate part of it. Um, and then I just want to give them more practice with that. Um, yeah, that's probably the main one right now that I'm looking at. Okay. Uh, so I want to switch gears again a little bit um, and talk about yeah. something that's that's hugely important in any chemistry classroom, and that's safety. Uh, what do you think is your most successful method for teaching safety to students? Well, um, <laughs> my colleagues. And I, the last few years, we have incorporated um, uh, it's a safety demonstration that Flynn Scientific came up with. We've been doing it now, I don't know, five, six, eight years. And it's like the second day of class. Um, and we dress up with, as we call her, I'm a chemist. I'm a chemist comes to class class. She's wearing a long wig, um, jewelry hanging all over, uh, sandals and, uh -oh. or flip-flops and cut-offs and mm -mm. anyway, she's supposedly a our super student. <laughs> she's come to them. Uh, and it's, it's basically you go through this whole experiment and you you break all the rules of the lab, you know, everything, she does everything raw. I'm a chemist, is, she drops glass on the floor and, you know, doesn't clean it up and spills chemicals and supposedly he with her hands, which we don't really do that, but we pretend the burner's lit and, okay. and, and uh, eat a candy bar and spray your hair over the burner. I mean, it just goes on and on. All these things. And then after to uh, evaluation, they go through the 54, 53 rules that Flynn has on their safety contract, and they have to decide which ones I'm a chemist broke. The whole, whole 
information, asking them to read through every rule and think about it. And they never forget that day. They never yeah. forget I'm a coming in and what she was like. And we have it. Um, I'm on YouTube if you want to see it sometime. <laughs> oh, great. We'll have to send folks to that because that sounds... My perfect. For I am a chemist. A-E-M-I-S-T. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. So. Yep. Um, so I want to switch gears again and kind of take take everybody out of your classroom, so to speak, and um, talk a little bit about teaching as a career and, and you know using your experience, having now been in the profession 41 years, which is amazing, um, and, and talk a little bit about teaching. So you have all this experience under your belt, and, and you know you talked before that teaching early on and early on in your career was difficult. So Knowing what you know now, what advice would you go back and give yourself as a new teacher? I think um, I would encourage new teachers to link up whenever possible with other teachers um, if they have a group in their area. Not all areas do. I know people are spread out all over the country, but if you have, we have a local history teachers go to get involved in it. Um, I didn't, in my first years of teaching, I didn't really get out and do a whole lot. I didn't go to conferences. Uh, I certainly didn't present at any conferences till much later. Later, Mike, I, I really think it's important to start doing that mm -hmm. as soon as you can, really. Um, there's so much useful <laughs> stuff out there. And like I said before, the chemistry people I know are really generous and really sharing people. Um, so I have this motto to be people should be a be a giver and be a taker. You know? Don't be afraid to take ideas from other people, adapt them and use them, but also be a giver, be willing to share. Sometimes occasionally I'll hear about teachers who are in a in a school where nobody shares with anybody else. You know, and they're all in their own little room and you can't even borrow a meter stick from them, you know, if you want one. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. I don't know why people, friend that's in a school now where she has to, she had to buy her own like data projector for her room, but she has to make sure it's locked up every night so nobody walks off with it. It's just, it's crazy. It's, but okay, so um, don't be afraid to try Thing, but tell them, tell them, teacher, or tell myself again. Don't be afraid to try something new. Be patient with yourself and with and with your students. And like I said earlier too, it's don't take yourself so serious. You're teaching teams are going to push your button. They're going to do whatever they can. They do know. They know what's gonna push. Okay, and they say, "Can we go outside today?" Well, you can either get or you can just say, no, not today. Have us gonna do some boring chemistry. Sit down. <laughs> but just laugh about it. Laugh about yourself and have fun. Have fun. I think that's great. I think that's great life advice for anyone. So that sounds appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Um, you so you you're obviously a phenomenal teacher. It sounds like a day in your class would be quite a lot of fun, um, and you probably mastered uh, quite a lot more than than when you started. And you're much more comfortable, obviously, in the classroom. Um, but did you make any mistakes along the way that you that you really learned from, and yet you'd like to share with us and think? in the hopes that someone can learn from your advice about those mistakes? Um, well, 
I the places the places I've taught I taught in addition to teaching all girls all bull. It was very, very interesting to know the differences with between boys and age girls in terms of joking around with them. Teenage girls, if you look at them the wrong way in September, they still haven't forgiven you in March. <laughs> and you don't even know what you did. So mistakes I've made, I'd say probably the one one of the mistakes is um, not being maybe as careful of some of the things I should have said when I've been around some of the girls. They just are really sensitive and I should have not maybe been as sarcastic as I was when I thought I was being sarcastic with the whole class, but they took it personally. So that's hard to know from yeah. girls. So, uh, other times, it's different for different people. Other people can be sarcastic and they don't mind, but I don't know something. So I have to learn. I have to learn what <laughs> what right amount of sarcasm I can use with them. Um, on a more practical, uh, a more practical level. A mistake I would say career wise is when I did start going to conferences, not um, getting the credits for them that you can get the you know graduates or the CE or the S whatever they have all different labels for these things. Yeah. And so I never once I had my masters, I never bothered accumulating additional hours. And I easily could have done that. And that would have been smart, probably. Could have got more money if I had done that. But I never did that. I would advise younger teachers that are going to conferences that. Well, most of them have to do it anyway because to keep upgrading. And I'm, you know, grandfathered past that kind of thing. But so those are my two two things, really. Watching what I say and. <laughs> Not getting the credit site shot. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's those are two great pieces of advice. Um, what would you say is, in contrast to that, what would you say is your proudest moment as a teacher? Um, boy, you know, you anytime, anytime a student comes back. Or contacts you once they're out of school and tells you something that they remember or they learned or they appreciate. That's those are what make you proud. Um, to Dallas to get the uh, Conant Award last March. One of my former students um, that I taught in the, my first. Stint at Mercy in se between 74 and 78. She's a PhD chemist in Houston. She wow. was able to come up for the awards banquet. And that that's, meant a lot to me. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That meant as much to me as getting the award. Oh. Um, yeah. So you make me. <laughs> sorry. The second time I made you cry, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that's a beautiful story. It's a good, good cry. It's a good yeah. cry. A good cry. No. Yeah. Absolutely. So we talked. We talked a little bit the about students. I'm sorry. What did you say? That's okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say. Um, we talked a little bit about the importance of kind of as a new teacher, um, you know, joining. Joining up with other teachers, and um, you mentioned that when you were at Mercy, when you started there, you, you know your department kind of mentored you in a way and, and inspired you and kept you going. Um, and you, of course, along the years have have been a mentor for other new teachers. Um, so, what advice would you give, not to the mentee, but to the mentor? Um, what makes what, what advice would you give them to help them be the best mentor that they could be? 
Um, well, again, I just come back to this a lot. It's just being willing to share mm -hmm. with people what you have and what you're going to do. And, and I don't understand people that don't do that. Mm. And so I'm hoping that, I mean, I would assume that anybody that undertakes a role of mentor would be would be willing to be sharing, whether it's their resources or their knowledge or their you know, favorite lab or whatever it is. You know, it's part of what I do, but also my colleagues that I work with. I just, um, and I know that it's not, that's not all it's about. You know, it's about also giving advice if there's a room or how to deal with this student, parent, being open and listening, just being and listening and, and trying to be aware uh, if they're having particular stresses in their situation. Uh, we had a, a teacher new to our department last year. She was a biology teacher, but I'm also the science chairperson, so I'm kind of overseeing what's going on with her. And she had some struggles, you know, initially with adapting to life at Mercy and any new school, any place new you go. But a lot of it dealt with certain students that were giving her trouble or parents and just have to be available to listen and, uh, and back them up. Mm -hmm. Unless they're doing something totally wrong, which then you need to tell them, but mostly be supportive. And I think, again, at our school, but from our administration, down to our department, you know, <coughs> everybody is, you know, you could, we knew she was a good teacher. We knew she just had to get over some humps and bumps. And probably 40 years ago, that's what somebody thought about me. <laughs> she just needs to get over these humps and bumps and she'll be fine. So just keep doing that for the next generation. All right, I'm getting dry here. <laughs> so, speaking of the next generation, um, there seems to be there seems to be a lot of national attention being paid to STEM education, um, and also a recognition that in order to achieve our um, you know qu quality STEM education, we need to retain good STEM educators. Um, and AACT is part of the 100K in 10 coalition to provide and support 100,000 excellent uh, STEM educators by the year 2021. So in your opinion, as someone who's surely seen, um, you know, surely witnessed good teachers leaving the profession, how do we keep good chemistry teachers in the classroom? <coughs> Well, um, I guess again, number one is is supporting them, mm -hmm. but now also that support include financial support, pay probably paying teachers <laughs> a little bit more than maybe they're getting to do the job they're doing. Sure. Um, there's, and I have so many wonderful friends in public schools that are in situations that it, you can't hardly teach mm. where they're at, and uh, uh, day after day, you know, there's so many other aspects of being a teacher. There's all the paperwork and all the technology and all these other frustrations that they don't realize that you have day to day. They think you're just something, 20 kids, 30 kids, and I don't know what people what, But anyway, um, so finance is something you can be done there. But, you know, 
practical. Here, I mean, again, this is another anecdote, but my one of my good friends in this area here, and I will not, not mention. I don't want to get her in trouble, but she's a wonderful chemistry teacher. <clears throat> she got moved in her district to another school to teach physics. The school she left has no one that wants to teach chemistry or is certified, I don't know, sir, they're certified, but that's not their major. Mm. Her major was chemistry. Why are teaching chemistry? That's, that's a school system issue. Mm. A, a, a superintendent, a head of science, I don't know who, somebody over there. <coughs> I don't get it. It doesn't mix to me because she's low seniority. So she couldn't stay, but she's the only one that wants to be teaching chemistry. There, you're losing. There, you're losing a good person that should be in the class doing one teaching physics too. But we need her in chemistry. <laughs> so there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of issues. I'm not big on politics. I'm not big on. I don't know. I don't watch a lot of stuff that goes on because I just sort of. Like my private school world, you know. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, I'm happy where I'm at. Well, good. So <laughs> yeah. I, so I actually just have one last question for you, and I'm going to ask you to kind of peer into your crystal ball. Um, and what do you think the chemistry classroom is going to look like in ten years, or what do you hope that it will look like in ten years? And then I want to make one other thing. <laughs> oh, but I just okay. thought of. Oh, sure. that's okay. Um, no, crystal ball, ten years. Wow. You know, if you asked me ten years ago what the next ten years like, I would not have known how much. Of course, how much technology has taken over yeah. the class. Um, I, that's a whole topic. Not tonight, um, but. And I'm sure in 10 more years, it's going to be even even more. There's mm -hmm. going to be even more that we're able to do with technology. And I, I think, um, I know some of my school, but other schools have done a lot of uh, global kind of connections. You know, one, a school in one state connecting with the school in another state, doing some competitions back and forth. <coughs> um, there's, you know, I think there's going to be a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. that you won't be so isolated in your own little school or your own little room. Uh, and I hope, though, that we don't ever lose sight of chemicals and chemical reactions. You know, hands-on. Even though we did this virtual lab simulation today in my, with my AP class, I don't ever want to, them to not <coughs> actually handle chemicals, mm -hmm. work with the chemicals. I mean, yeah. That's where it starts. And people that talk about the old chemistry sets that they had as kids, and I never had a chemistry set. But, you know, I, that would have been fun. Uh, and now they're so limited to things that you could do. Um, yeah. You don't want to be unsafe, but you still want to be able to have fun with chemi chemicals. So that reminds, that brings me back to what I also want to say. And it has to do with the mentor thing. Sure. Because I just found out that the American Chemical Society has an uh, ACS mentors. Program and I don't know, are you? I'm sorry. Do you know? Do you know about the ACS mentors? I don't. Please tell me. Okay. <laughs> well, I just saw a quick little article about it, probably in the uh, CNE News or that um, they're looking for like retired teachers, retired chemists, who they'll I think they'll link up with an uh, elementary school or a middle school teacher 
and you become the mentor for that teacher to their room. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're talking about I'm science. thinking about that. You're talking about science coaches? Is that I think you're talking about science coaches. Uh, I think that's it. Maybe yeah, chemistry coaches. Yeah, I think that's like the official uh, title of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's it's a great program. So I'm next. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Well, thanks for reminding everyone about the program. Um, <laughs> we've reached we've reached the hour point, so that that flew yeah. by. Yeah. Wow, that flew by. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it was great. Um, those are all the questions we have for this evening. So, um, thanks to thanks to everyone who was watching, and we really appreciate you. And hopefully, um, you took some ideas away for your own classroom or or you know for any projects you have on the horizon. And of course. Thank you so much, Kathy, for chatting with us. It was an absolute pleasure, and um, I kind of want to spend a day in your class. It sounds like a lot of fun, so thanks for thanks for joining us. You're up this way. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, good night. Good Thank night, everyone. So